Hey Matt. Hey Craig. What are you doing? You know, the singularity's coming, Craig. Gotta get ready to battle those hordes of robots with my rare earth magnet sword and the sopping wet blanket. Gross. You know, according to robotics professor Elon Norbach, you don't necessarily have to worry about that. Oh yeah? Yeah. We need to stop worrying so much about robots taking over the universe. And instead we need to start worrying about corporations taking over the universe using robots today, next year, 10 years from now. Because that's coming really soon. Uh, well, maybe we should be a little worried. The middle class is just exploding downward. Power relationships are such that computers are becoming ever more powerful. Corporations are becoming ever more powerful. And the ordinary person, you and me, we're losing power rapidly. And you think that you attribute corporations becoming more powerful to robotics, to AI and... Absolutely. Uh-oh. There is evidence that computers are getting faster, and that means they're gonna data mine better, they're gonna be able to decide how we're gonna behave in the future better, they'll predict our behavior much better, they'll be able to isolate you and look at where your pupils are looking as you walk down the road and tell what advertising you look at and don't look at. It's information that's the name of the game. Companies are gonna own ever more information about our behavior, about the way we move our muscles, the way we do purchasing decisions, who we speak to and what we email in our content. All of that information is something they use to optimize us. They're not optimizing us for personal quality of life, they're optimizing us to be the best possible consumers and producers we can be. In a way, they're, they're making us robots. It's the yeah. biggest irony of our time, yeah. is that corporations can use robotic technology to track us so well and to learn what buttons to push on us to get the right response out of us that we become the robots. So basically, corporations are getting better at knowing what we want. What's so bad about that? Well, sure, there's nothing necessarily wrong with corporations and advertising, but marketing can do some pretty shady things, like tricking us into thinking we need something we don't. And super intelligent marketing computers could make the problem worse. Also, consider what could happen to the voting process. Whenever a politician wants votes, what do they do? They get together some people, have a little affinity group, interview you, figure out what's the pitch that gets you to vote for them. When they're getting really good at behaviorally analyzing just you, learning what you buy, what movies you watch, what you get on your Advantage card at the local supermarket, because they track all that now. They'll build a model of you that's special. It is highly unique. And unlike regular marketing and salespeople who can just do a few experiments on 100,000 people, a machine learning algorithm running on a website, it can market individually and uniquely to every individual person on Earth. It can keep trying stuff out until it finds the tropes, the buttons, the phrases that work for you, literally. Gradually, the voter is being bombarded by exactly the right signal to vote exactly in the way that's desired by the politician. What happens to democracy when what we hear is so one-sided, one, so carefully, uniquely crafted, that we have no choice but to vote for the right person? That's not really democracy anymore. Is there a good side to it, though? I mean, there's also the oh, side of, of learning about yourself for health reasons, I suppose. Absolutely. There is something about robotics which is really powerful, which is if you present the information to the individual person, it can help empower them about their own life, make better life decisions. We actually have a project called Body Track where we help people use all the gadgets they can, from Fitbit to Jawbone to body media to sleep monitors you can wear at night and see how you sleep, to all the accelerometers you wear in your phones, like Samsung phones. We can actually collect all that information and show it to you at one time. So now you can see, for instance, when you exercise, how do you sleep that night? And when you eat tomatoes, does that cause a problem for the way you sleep? So in other words, do you have an allergy you didn't know about to nightshades, for instance, which is what tomatoes have? But that means putting information in the hands of people. Are people going to have control? Are people going to get to look at the information and make their own decisions? Or are companies going to have massive information that basically allows them to top us? I don't know. Corporations? Probably. So you're going to see two movements. You're going to see companies ever more capable to uniquely interact with us in a customized way and control us, and you're gonna see a backlash against that, and it's gonna be at the community level, where communities have drones, they have air quality sensors, water quality sensors, and they start using these devices to capture the data that allows them to present a case that you just, you can't dismiss it. Oh, that's true, Matt. We actually made a video about this. Remember the people versus the coal plant? Yeah, they got the Fisk and Crawford coal plants shut down in Chicago. That's right. People had been complaining about those coal plants for years, but it wasn't until they put a lead monitor on top of a local elementary school that they were able to prove that the air was toxic and get the support they needed to shut those coal plants down. So you're going to see two kinds of power, and that's going to be the battle for the next 10 to 20 years is between those two different kinds of power. Um, who's going to win? That's what I was going to ask. Who's going to win? Yeah, who's going to win, Craig? And do I need my sword? No. You don't need your sword.
You never need your sword. It's not that kind of battle. It's more of a battle for information. But unfortunately, the average citizen's already falling behind. The path we're on right now yeah. has the companies winning. People are not going to be able to win until people get to invent the right technologies. That means we have to have really good education so people can be technologically fluent and invent and bend the future. For that to happen, we have to change education. According to data collected by the National Center for Education Statistics, in 2013, more than half of the students in the United States public school system were from low-income households. Now, if you stop and think about that for a second, right? More than half. That means that there's a clothing issue, there's a nutrition problem, there's a heat in the home issue which makes you sick. You can't do your studies. You come to school, you're hungry, you have to deal with basic necessities. You can't teach them to become technologically fluent, to become really good at collecting data, building your own robot and changing the world for the positive. As long as we allow that to be the case in the US, we have inequity because the, the people in the know will be the corporate owners, the owners of capital. And the people who are not in the know will continue becoming more and more poor. Communities could have a chance, but they have to have education. So there is a chance, Matt, and a good example of robotics education in action can be found right here in our grand city of Chicago. Chicago Knights is a cosmopolitan all-city team. It's for high school students who want to build competitive robots. We started the team because myself and a few other parents wanted to find some academic enrichment for our kids. And in the city of Chicago, especially on the south side, in 2005, we could not find those opportunities. The community is really interested in learning about science and technology, but many of the people, especially the girls, have not been encouraged to do so. I am what you call like the lead programmer. I'm the head of most of what we do. So this is like kind of my first year starting with robotics. I've never done it before and it's like, it's something that I've, like instantly, I've caught on to. It's something that I like. I just um, updated the code to make the robot move its wheels and um, we're testing it through the um, driver station to see what's going on with the wheels and what we need to change or any, if any changes need to be made. These two back wheels, they moving this way or they moving back towards us? I like the challenges. We come across a lot of problems, a lot of things that happen where we need a solution to this and how are we gonna get this to work? The robot does, is not moving, so now what? Jackie Moore reached out to students in the community by taking over a storefront in Chicago's Ford City Mall and converting it into a robot workshop. They're in a mall? That seems like kind of an odd place for a robotics team. Well, there's actually a good reason for that. This location was intentional because we wanted to go where the students who are not involved in things already can find us. When young people stumble across a learning opportunity, they actually own it more. Hmm. So by discovering something on their own instead of being forced to do something, kids are actually learning more because they want to learn. Interesting concept, right? Our students come from a variety of academic settings, homeschool, parochial school, public school. Majority of them are Chicago public school students, but we don't turn away those who are not. they are also different levels of ability from those who are on the autism spectrum to those who've identified as highly gifted. We've had game bangers who have stuck with it and made some adjustments. We have uh, guys who are on the streets, so we are making a difference. In addition to being inclusive and providing a valuable learning opportunity, the Chicago Knights also compete in what is known as a little something called the first robotics competition. The first robotics competition, what's that all about? Cue montage. <laughs> First is probably one of the best kept secrets around. It is an awesome way to introduce uh, young people to engineering. FIRST stands for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. Kids from ages 6 through 18 team up to create their own robots to do specific tasks and compete against other teams. My uncle was actually on the team, and so one day I tagged along with him to a tournament, and I've been hooked ever since. The Chicago Knights are gearing up for the first Midwest regional competition, but will they be ready? Well, most definitely. We got this. Yeah? You no, know, we got this. We, we going all the way. Going all the way. No. Going all the way. Everybody say robots keep us going. I just got done dropping off robots. And we in the pit trying to fix up robots. All these judges want to look at our robots. Sounds like Chicago, but we still build robots. Fort City Mall is the home of our robots. Chicago go nice and you know we love robots. Wait, you lost communication? The Knights put up a valiant effort and were ranked pretty high for a mostly rookie team. But unfortunately, their robot didn't score high enough to advance the Knights to the final tournament. I'm a little upset because I, I don't like to lose, but I mean, we all lose as a team and we always have 
more chances after this. If you want to encourage young people to do something, celebrate it. We celebrate athletes, we celebrate celebrities. The average nine-year-old wants to be an athlete or celebrity. Let's change the whole conversation and let's celebrate scientists and engineers. From all of us here at The Good Stuff, we'd like to wish the Chicago Knights good luck in all of their future robotic endeavors. Of course, even if they don't advance in the competition, they're still learning about robotics, and that's the whole point, right, Craig? Right. The first competition is just one example of encouraging kids to learn about robotics. And as technology progresses, it's going to become more and more important. But just because we're learning about robotics, robots doesn't mean we need to become robots. That's right on the money, Matt. So, as we wrap up this episode about robots, let's leave you with some suggestions about how to not be a robot. Number one, don't blindly follow your programming. Number two, don't be afraid of water because you're not made of electricity. Tip number three, don't drink motor oil. Tip number four, oh my oh. god, it's a robot! Oh god, stay oh. back! Oh. Get the wet blanket! Get the wet blanket now! Too late, it's dry! No! 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 <laughs> <laughs> Get him! Turns out the robot was just lonely and needed some friends. He's actually pretty cool. So, this is the end of the robots playlist. If you liked it, you can click like right down there. And if you want to subscribe to see more of our videos, there's a link right up there. And if you want to support our show and help it keep going, you can go to our Patreon page and subscribe over there. That's all. I hope you enjoyed. Did you enjoy it? Ow! That kind of hurts. Lighter next time. Yeah, that's still kind of hurts, but it's okay.